Well, good evening. I want to thank you for tuning in this evening uh, uh, as we continue our study in Job. Um, if you are, I'm hoping that you are watching this online and not sitting in uh, the, 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 the church because uh, Awana's was tonight. So this has been pre-recorded. So if I talk like I'm not actually talking on Wednesday night, uh, it's because I'm not. I'm actually talking on Sunday afternoon. So, um, but I want to thank uh, the men, the elders, uh, Brian, uh, for their teaching through Job um, and the opportunities they give me again. Uh, what an, uh, an awesome thing it has been for me to be able to study through Job, and I hope that it will be for you. Uh, so let us, let us open in prayer, and then we're going to jo- jump into Job chapter 14. So let's pray. God, I thank you so much uh, for your word. Lord, I thank you for what you have taught me through this study. Lord, I pray that you would open the hearts of those listening, Lord, that uh, you may teach them. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me this evening. Uh, and Lord, I pray that, uh, that, that your word would go forth and not come back void as you have promised us. Lord, I pray this all in your son's precious name. Amen. All right, so tonight uh, we're going to be looking at the closing response uh, that Job gives to the first round of his three friends. Uh, And we're really going to see that uh, in in this response that Job here is, is really delving deeper into his despair. Uh, It's a downward spiral we're seeing. Uh, Elder Chuck pointed this out. uh, The distress, uh, he he pointed this out when he uh, taught chapter 10. uh, The the distress he is beginning to show. Uh, And before we are too hard on Job, uh, we we have to remember the suffering that he's exactly, the exact suffering he's been through, right? We've we've read about all that. And we're not even sure exactly how long he has suffered. It's it's been, uh, as far as we can tell, at least probably a couple months of suffering, if not possibly decades. I talked about that on, uh, in chapter seven. Um, You know, it's not only physical suffering, but we, we also see um, here as we can imagine, going through all the suffering, to, to even have your friends press upon you as Job has. The friends that should be your comfort turn in to be your torment. So not only here is Job having to deal with the suffering, he's having to respond to his friends. And we see as we close this response tonight. But you know what? I cannot even blame his friends. Can I say that I would have acted any differently? Uh, you see, as humans, especially here in Americans, as Americans, we relish this retribution theology that's been so prominent through here. Uh, Elder Brian has been um, adamant and, and, and rightfully so about this throughout Job as he brought that up. You see, it's this eye for an eye train of thought. And we, we, we love that here, right? Oh, yes, yeah, somebody does something to me, I'm going to get them back, right? Uh, uh, what is it, the, the movie Medea? Uh, I think uh, she talks you know, about that. You know, I'm supposed to get them before they get me kind of idea here. Uh, and, and we laugh and joke about that, but, but really what we're going to see here is how wrong that is in our own theology. You see... We apply our own motivators, our own motivation for this retribution theology. We try to apply that to God and form a doctrine around how we think God acts without any biblical support. To be honest with you, my response would be no different than Zophar's. As I've been studying through Job, uh, especially leading up to this week, I've kind of taken a different look and I've tried to look at Job's responses as if I didn't have any of the information that were given in the first couple chapters. If you look at Job's responses and you didn't have the dialogue between God and Satan, if you didn't have God saying that Job was a righteous man, if you didn't have Job or God um, uh, or the book of Job 
uh, laying out for you Job's life beforehand and his righteousness. If all we had was Job's response, I can imagine myself responding no different than Zophar or worse than him. What have I condemned Job myself? Probably. And as we see here, as I've been studying, uh, I, I, you, you see, I, I would have thought Job responded to Eliphaz and Bildad out of arrogance when we looked at his response to them. If you read through Job's responses, without the insight of God's dialogue, it would be really easy for us. And it's the same in our own life as New Testament Christians. We make quick judgments based upon having the completed story. Yet many times in our own life, we don't have that completed story. And we make base, quick judgments based upon what we see before us. And what God has showed me through Job here, as I will teach through tonight, is that how often... My theology is wrong. It takes so little for us to uh, begin to question God. Elder Chuck, I love that man. He gave a moving testimony when he taught chapter 10. And I must admit, as he was mourning right here behind this pulpit before you, I was weeping with him why because it reminded me so how so often i have done the very same thing over much less how many times have i questioned god how many times have i said god i deserve better the fact of the matter is i deserve much worse god is so good to us you see job is now beginning to openly question God and is really pushing that boundary. Tonight we'll see Job's conclusion that the dialogue and the realization that no matter how far man goes, he cannot move beyond the limits set for him by God. Really, Job here returns to the cycle of these conversations back to the very beginning of the dialogue with his friends. And that is trouble has overwhelmed his life. So tonight, I'm going to break this up into three sections. Job chapter 14. We're going to look first at the first verses 1 through 12. Job here reveals the brevity and the pain of man's life. Secondly, in verses 13 through 17, Job contemplates the hope for man. Third section, 18 through 22, Job falls back even deeper into despair. So tonight I'm not going to read through the whole thing at first. I'm going to read through each section as we go through it uh, for, for the sake of time. Uh, so let's start here, Job chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. And do not and do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me into judgment with you? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you, and you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass. Look away from him and leave him alone, that he may enjoy like a hired hand his day. For there is hope for a tree, if it be cut down, let it, it will, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its roots grow old in the earth, and the stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. But a man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his last, and where is he? As waters fail from a lake and a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and rises not again. Till the heavens are no more, he will not wake or be roused out of his sleep. So Job here, man, he's just getting deeper into his despair of the hopelessness of man. Job starts off with verse 1. 
He says, man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. He brings it right back to uh, where he began his, his responses uh, and, and really ended it in, verse, in, in chapter 3. And we see here, as one commentator says, he says, he has listened to three speeches by, his, by the friends who have tried to explain that trouble. In response to all that he has heard, however, his basic perspective on life remains unchanged. Human beings are born to a life full of trouble. And when all is said and done, they know nothing beyond the pain of their own miserable existence. This is the reality that Job finds himself in. You see, when Job finds himself into this retribution theology... He finds that there has to be something and that there is no hope for him. You see, despite all of the advice and discussion thus far, his friends and Job himself are no closer to discovering who God is. And we struggle with this today, don't we? One of the greatest questions asked today by non-believers and believers alike is how can a good and loving God allow such evil to exist? You know, I, was, um, I, I, I taught the youth this past Wednesday, um, which would have been a week from when this airs. And uh, I was, a week before that, God had really just broke my heart over a man. This man's name is John Steingard. Uh, Many of you may know him. He was the lead singer for the Christian band Hawk Nelson. He came out and he said, I no longer believe in God. The truth of the matter is, according to really his own words in an interview, he never believed in God. This question of how can a good and loving God allow such evil to exist was the breaking point. Uh, for him and realizing that he, he cannot believe in a God because he says that he cannot reconcile nor has the church ever been able to reconcile that question. It broke my heart. You see the, in the interview with him it broke my heart because this very thing not only condemns him, but it condemns the church as a whole. You see, it condemns the church as a whole because John Steingard was a PK kid. He was a preacher's kid. His father, he said his father's led him and father led him in the sinner's prayer when he was four or five years old. It condemns the church because as a pastor, his father never taught him this vital lesson. You see, and I'm not going to go any detail, much detail further than that, but I tell you this. You see, we don't need to reconcile that question. And no, the church has not reconciled that question because that, church, that question was reconciled in the Old Testament scriptures and we had no need to reconcile it. The problem is people don't like the answer. The problem is it's still a form of retribution theology. The church is failing to teach fun, very fundamental truths about Scripture. The problem is, again, people don't want to accept the answer. The people don't want to accept that a holy and just God causes calamity in this world for his purposes. If you don't believe me, read Psalms 105 or Isaiah 45 to start with. This was the same issue Job and his friends were dealing with. The only thing is today we kind of deal with it on the, the opposite side, right? We look at today and we say, well, how can God, who is good, cause evil? Job and his friends were looking at it how it must have been an evil person who caused God to do evil. They're the same or opposite sides of the same coin. One must beget the other. 
And we apply this to our doctrine and our theology of God. And it's amazing as I studied through Job and I see his friend's response and I see this theology in them that God has allowed me to correct my own theology in my own life. How often I would look at someone and judge them saying they must have sin in their life because God would not punish somebody. Yet throughout scripture we can see that God does things for his own purposes. He works everything together for good that that love and believe in him. But that doesn't mean that trouble does not come our way. It just means that that trouble is for our own good. And sometimes our own good is simply to glorify God. So how can a righteous man have trouble? We can imagine how easy it was it... uh, To account Job's trouble for something he has done, he must have done something. Even in our thinking today, we think that way. Why point all this out? Well, forgive me, I I can't remember if it was Elder Brian uh, or Elder Tom that talked about uh, how these three friends had the incorrect theology. But why talk about this? It's so that we can study it and we can learn from it and we can correct our own theology. You see, these first 12 verses, Job explains his despair about life. In verses 1 through 6, Job explains the troubles of life for man. And then he contrasts man and nature in verses 12, 7 through 12. So let's kind of read through this and talk about it. I'm starting verse 1. Man who is born of trouble is few a days and full of man, man, sorry, man who is born of woman is few a days and full of trouble. Again, Job here is saying, there's no hope for men. We will all have trouble. We will all face this pain. And we have to remember Job is speaking out of despair here. In verse 2 he says, he comes out like a flower and withers. Like a, he flees like a shadow and continues not. Man, we see this just a brevity of life. How short life is. We come up like a flower and then we wither away. And it's interesting here in verse 2, he says he flees like a shadow and he continues not. Job, is, Job here is, is uh, giving a, a, a precursor to what he talks about later on when he says he continues not about how the permanence of death for man. He says, and you do not open your eyes to such a one and bring me into judgment with you. Who can bring a clean thing Out of an unclean. There is not one. It reminisces here to me of Romans chapter 3 where where Paul writes that there is not one that is good. Not one is righteous. Not one even seeks after God. Job here says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. Again, he's recognizing the, the the. The state of man and and our hopelessness to save ourselves. We can't do it. He says there is not one. Verse 5, he says, Since his days are determined and the number of his months is with you, you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass. God is sovereign over our lives. Even in his despair, Job is still recognizing the sovereignty of God. Perhaps it is just simply because at this point, Job realizes that he cannot even get away from it. Verse 6, look away from him and leave him alone, that he may enjoy like a hired hand his day. The Hebrew here talks basically about, and, and instead of leave him alone, it says let him cease to be. Job's talking about death here. He's saying, God, I wish you would just leave me alone. I wish you would look away from me and let me cease that I may enjoy the end of my suffering. But if we go back to verse 5, he's even admitting even in that statement that God is control of everything. God has set the limits on his life. 
And then we get to verse, verse uh, 7. We look at 7 through 12. And, verses, and, and, and to be honest with you, verses 7 through 9 almost sound hopeful. But Job is not being hopeful here when we read this. You have to understand. it Because it, it, Job ends it here with a near accusation against God for showing preferable treatment to trees rather than man. He says in verse 7, For there is hope for a tree... If it be cut down, it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its roots grow old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. Now, I know exactly what Job is talking about here, because I have uh, over, we've been at our house now for, I guess, 10, 11 years. My, I'll get corrected on that. Um, but when we bought the house, it had a kind of a small backyard. Still does generally, but but it had a really small backyard. Well, over the last decade or so, I've been slowly clearing out the trees to make the yard bigger. Um, and there's some trees over on the edge of what our yard be that I cut down and just kind of left. Well, we'd leave the stumps. And the uh, I found that, man, if you don't take care of that stump, you have like eight trees grow back in its place. Um, and it, and it's, it is, it's wild to me because that stump sticking out of the ground like that, no branches, yet it will start to grow branches uh, back off. And that's what Joe's talking about. Even, even trees have hope that if they're cut down, they will sprout back up. And it almost sounds hopeful until we get to verse 10. But a man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his last and where is he? He's talking about if a man is cut off and he breathes his last. Job says, where is he? And as waters fail from a lake in verse 11 and a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and, not, and rises not again. Till the heavens are no more, he will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. He's saying that there is a hope for a tree, but he said when man, when God ceases a man, it is the end. He will not rise again. When we get to verses 13 through 17, we see this hopeful section. This hopeful section seems to be Job dreaming about how he wished God would deal with him. Job here is saying that he wishes for the comfort and safety of Abraham's bosom, uh, Sheol. As we read through this, verses 13 through 17, we will see that. And he says, Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past." That you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service I would wait till my renewal should come. You would call and I would respond to you. You would long for my, the work of my hands. For then you would number my steps. You would not keep watch over my sin. My transgression would be sealed up in a bag and you would cover my iniquity. You see, when we read that, Man, it seems like Job is taking hope. It seems like all of Job's uh, response is going to take a turn here and he's going to come back to God and say, God is still my hope. He is my hope in all this. And when we talk about this, I want to, I want to get into a little bit of, of uh, Sheol here. Uh, and I am by no means a, a uh, master scholar on the Old Testament. Uh, but I've done a little research here. And we remember in Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 30, Jesus talks about Abraham's bosom and he talks about Hades. Now, Hades and Sheol are essentially the same place. 
And it seems like there was two parts according to Jesus in Luke 16. One part was for those Old Testament saints who did not believe. And one was for those who did. If you did not believe, you went to Sheol or Hades as the holding place that waited for final judgment. Uh, according to Luke chapter 16, there was, uh, it's a, it's a uh, we, we see the, uh, um, the story here, starting in verse 22, and it says, The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side, what we call Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried and in Hades. Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. So I want to have this place of Sheol is either a place of rest for New Old Testament saints, or it was a place of torment in a holding place for unbelievers. Hades is still there today, although when Christ was resurrected, he took the Old Testament saints to him with heaven, in heaven. And today, we're, no, we're, we're told by Paul to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When, we, when, a, when a believer dies a day, we go directly to the Lord. We no longer go to this holding place, rest. But as our believers, we still go to this holding place of Hades. We're told in Revelation, John says that all of Hades after the great white throne judgment will be poured out into the lake of fire. So we have to understand that when Job is talking about Sheol here and wanting rest and his hope, Job is relishing in the hope of salvation the same as we do today. We have comfort that our sin is sealed from us and that he covers our iniquities. One thought is that God still chooses us despite knowing the transgressions we will still commit after revealing his truth to us. What a great hope we have in the salvation of God that he holds us firm despite ourselves. And in verses, and so we see in these verses, Job, great hope. But he's almost writing this in a mocking tone, as we will see in verse 18. But before we get there, let's look at this a little deeper. He says, verse 13, Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. Job again here is just saying, Lord, let me go to my rest, that you will hold me fast And that you will conceal me until your wrath is past. He's asking God to to allow him to enter Abraham's bosom and rest. In verse 14 he says, if a man dies, shall he live again? He said, all the days of my service I would wait until my renewal should come. He said, if there's a chance to live again, I would wait. He said, you would call me and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands. He is admitting that he is still made by God. He is God's holy. And God has control over his life. And what he is saying here is, God, I I want you to long after me. Remember me. He said he wishes that you would long for the work of your hands. He's talking to God here. Verse 16 says, For you would number my steps. You would not keep watch over my sin. My transgression would be sealed up in a bag and you would cover my iniquity. Oh Lord, help us. May we be like this. 
If you are a believer in Christ, you are like this. If you are a believer in Christ, your transgressions have been sealed up. They were sealed on the cross and done away with. And we don't have to ask that he would cover our iniquity. Our iniquity has already been covered. And that leads us into our final section here. Verses 18 through 22. And as far as what a great hope 13 through 17 was, we know that it wasn't, it was but a dream to Job. Because his response in 18 through verses 18 and 19 are the pinnacle and are ultimately his despair. Let's read this, 18 through 22, and he says, But the mountains fail. And remember, I want you, want you to get that but in the beginning of verse 18. But the mountains fail and crumbles away, and the rock is removed from its place. The waters wear away the stones, the tor torrents wash away the soil of the earth. So you destroy the hope of men. You prevail forever against him, and he passes. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to honor, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he perceives it not. He feels only the pain of his own body, and he mourns only for himself. In verse 18, the very first word, but, is an important turning place because verses 13 through 17 is the great hope. And he knows we can tell that it's a dream because of that but, because Job says, but, the mountain fell and crumbles away. And at the end of verse 19, he says, so you destroy the hope of man. You see, this is the very pinnacle of Job's despair. Verses 18 and 19 are the very pinnacle of his response to his friends. These mountains, rock, stones, waters are the things that the natural man can depend on, right? We can depend on them. They're hard, unmovable things, according to man. Things that last but Job says, just as you, O God, make them wash away and crumble away, so you destroy the hope of man. At last, Job relinquishes himself into despair. All his hope is destroyed. In verse 20, Job says, God prevails against him forever. His time of torment is so long that his sons have come to mourn. His passing, this is metaphorical. That his sons would have come to mount more in his past, and even them would have passed themselves. Yet nothing concerns him but his own pain. One commentator says this, But the world Job dreams of does not exist. Neither does the God who might bring it into being. In the real world, even the strongest are gradually worn down to nothing. When one looks to nature, the truth is that even the most solid and resilient objects of creation, mountains, rocks, stones, can be destroyed by the relentless erosion of water. When one looks to human beings, the truth is that God destroys every hope with the irresistible, same irresistible force. In the end, the fate of all human beings is the same. God overpowers them in life. And when, they're, when, it, when at last their face has been disfigured by age and suffering, God dispatches them, them to the hopeless permanence of death. Once banished, the dead are forever cut off from the land of the living. They cannot know whether their children live to be honored or belittled. All that is left to them is the lingering pain of flesh that can no longer feel the mournful lament of a soul that can no longer cry. With these poignant images of death, Job concludes his last speech in the first cycle of the same manner as he's done in each of his previous speeches. For the one who insists on asking why, there remains no answer. For the one who dares to hope for a life beyond this and for a God beyond this God, there is only the deepening conviction that the boundaries imposed on humankind render both yearnings and 
render both yearnings null and void. You see, what he's saying here is that Job has come to the belief and understanding that there is no life after this life that does not have to deal with God. And there is no God beyond this God because God has proven that he is the only one. So I want to ask you this. Is Job's assessment true? Well, the answer is yes. If we place our hope in man rather than God, God will certainly be against us. Job's assessment in verse 4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. It's a correct one. When dealing with man, no one, Romans 3 tells us that, no one is clean. Let me ask you this. Are you putting your faith and trust in God or are you putting your faith and trust in man? Are you letting this story of Job and this story of his friends shape your theology? Or are you willing to stay in this human motivated ideal of who God is? Or are we letting scripture dictate what our doctrine is? Let us pray. God, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that we would seek you for who you are and not who we want you to be. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you concern yourselves with us. Lord, I pray that we would see you as the sovereign God and I pray that we would get on your side. And Lord, we would realize that our purpose here is to glorify you. And yes, Lord, you tell us right up front, Lord, that we will face trials and tribulations and troubles. Lord, if we are to be a believer in you, you tell us, Lord, that the world will hate us. Lord, they don't hate us because of us. Lord, they hate us because of you, because they first hated you. God, I pray that we would not wrap ourselves in the banner of this world, but we would wrap ourselves in the banner of Christ. Lord, that even when we go through trials and tribulations, we would, attain, we would attribute them to your glory. And Lord, when we see others going through trials and tribulations, that we would attribute that to your glory. And that we would not automatically jump on the bandwagon of somebody, there must be retribution. And Lord, certainly we must investigate sin. But Lord, I pray that we would give grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy as you have done us. Lord, I thank you. We love you. It's in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.